thanks, Kate, and welcome everybody. And thanks, Kate, for leaving out my prison time. <laughs> uh, in your intro, let's talk about uh, Pulse today. And I would wager that everybody uh, on video has had a, a fairly elaborate experience with physician orders for life-sustaining therapy, which is the uh, physician order advance directive or provider order advance directive most commonly used on the West Coast. There's a number of other directives used elsewhere, which we'll allude to along the way. There's a most medical orders for sustaining treatment. There's a most medical orders for life-sustaining treatment, <laughs> etc. You get the idea. They're all orders signed by both a provider, whether it be a nurse practitioner, physician assistant, somebody with prescriptive authority, or a physician, and the patient or their legal surrogate to direct their uh, advanced planning. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that and about how Pulse is different or the same to a living will. We'll talk about research behind the Pulse form, which is a national uh, investigative effort with hundreds of papers being published about it. And then we're gonna uh, race through some cases and I need your input on these cases to get your feelings about Pulsed. The Pulsed form works most of the time. I'll present some uh, data to you showing that it's a, actually a very effective instrument uh, in advocating for physicians' advanced directives, in the way we perform as medical systems in a compassionate and appropriate way. Uh, it's not 100% effective, which we'll talk about, but darn close. It's getting better and better the more people have experience with it. Here's an old pink form. The way these forms differ is they have a little bit different names across the country and different day glow colors. So here's an early one from Oregon that's day glow kind of pink lavender. The ones you see in Washington State these, these, are, these days are day glow kind of booger green uh, forms. Uh, and I've seen bright purple ones in Illinois. So they, they look different across the country, but the or originators of it were really at the University of Oregon, Susan Toll and others, and it has disseminated over the past couple of decades to be a very useful uh, item. So uh, all, you know, getting close to 30 years ago, at least a quarter of a century ago, the Oregon Pulse Task Force was formed and the orders uh, were put together. They have morphed over the years. They do not look identical across the country. So be careful when you work in different states, they might look a little bit differently. It can be signed by a provider, turns patient preferences and advanced directives into orders to hopefully ensure that their wishes for treatment are honored. Now, this doesn't take, in a take into account a couple of things. You all can chime in on what you think it doesn't take account of. One is, like most advanced directives, it doesn't, it doesn't morph as people's feelings, desires, and wishes change, right? So over the years, you can imagine you'd write something down on a post form that might be different after a couple of years. Uh, the other thing it doesn't do very well is for those nurse practitioners, physician assistants, and physicians in the audience, you know how often our quote unquote orders are followed, right? Not probably 100% of the time. Our orders are variably followed. Uh, so even though it turns it into an order, uh, some people can take it or leave it. How's it different from a living will? Well, lots of healthy people have living wills, even though a minority of adults in the United States have a living will. A lot of those people are completely healthy. They just want to indicate what they want to have happen if they get really sick. And a living will can, can either be incredibly nonspecific, which really most of them are, or it can list an innumerable number of treatments and myriad circumstances. Uh, but usually it's supposed to be a clear statement of preferences. It has to be gotten unless it's actually in our medical records and we can access it easily, which isn't always easy. And you might need to interpret it because they're, they're very individualized and look different. 
A pulse form is actually intended for people who are seriously ill, uh, not necessarily for when you're healthy, although I bet you a lot of us use it for healthy people uh, in clinic, etc. cetera. Uh, and it's fairly uh, finite number of options that we choose to uh, accept or not. The, box, the preferred boxes are checked. The patient owns the post. They can make a ton of copies of it and put it all over the place. A lot of patients will put it on the refrigerator, on the back of their front door, make a miniaturized one, laminate it, and put it in their wallet. All kinds of different things can happen with a pulse form. Uh, most of us with electronic records now try to scan it into our EMR system. And it's a, as we talked about a minute ago, it's a physician order to be followed, may or may not be. The top box is al almost always CPR, whether to accept it or not. And I like the newest ones that choose between CPR and not just DNR, but allow natural death. That's a more lay term. And it's kind of like we're, what we're going to do for you, not what we're not going to do for you. Allow natural death is more embracing, and I think a more compassionate way to put the box to your right uh, for DNR. And then people choose comfort measures only, limited additional interventions, and, and full treatment. What many people don't take advantage of is writing their specific wishes in additional orders. I wish there was a bigger box for that because people should use any blank space on this form to get specific about what they do and don't want. In the back, we often forget to look on the back, but on Washington State's form, this is where we put stuff about whether you want a feeding tube or not and sign it again. And this is the way we can change our pulsed form. But again, often we don't look on the back. Let's talk a little bit about research over the past couple of decades to show you how useful these, been, these have been on a policy and medical care level. Over a decade ago, it was shown that the POST agrees with the advance directive in Washington nursing home residents with a high satisfaction rate. 94% of uh, nursing homes in Oregon reported treatment consistent with POST. Now this is nursing homes reporting it, not individuals. But it was fairly closely followed with the exception of tube feeding and antibiotics. It got a little loosey-goosey with whether those were actually followed or not. Uh, but for resuscitation uh, and, and major interventions, it's largely followed. Most California hospitals have POST policies in there's high pulse compliance resulting in lower rates of hospitalization and hospital death. So this is having an effect on medical care. Okay? So that's the end of the didactic piece of this. And now we're going to go through some cases, and we want to get you all in the audience responding a little bit. So that's okay, right? People can chime in. Let's look at this first one. Here's a 90-year-old man with adv advanced renal failure. He's been getting dialysis for a couple of years. He also has cognitive impairment, probably Alzheimer's disease. Uh, history of alcoholism that is not currently active. Pretty bad vascular disease. Uh, and he's admitted to the hospital with pneumonia from the kidney center. And the pulse that comes from the kidney center says no code, DNR, but full treatment. Okay, so we want to find out, uh, we want you to vote on whether you think this is valid, invalid, or see any problems with this pulse? Is this? Okay, most people think it's okay. Yeah, this is a guy who's, you know, he's getting dialysis, pretty in invasive uh, procedure three times a week. So for them, for a layperson who has a lot of medical history, this might represent kind of full treatment. You know, I'm on this machine three times a week. Uh, so wanting, continuing to want that, continuing to want another machine like a ventilator or something like that, wouldn't be foreign territory for this guy. Uh, on the other hand, if he's dead, it's okay to leave him that way, which is the DNR part of things. So this is actually a reasonable post form, and a lot of people in ICUs choose this. 
they say DNR, but I want full treatment. They might be on the ventilator when they have their pulse filled out. So that's not, uh, that's not inconsistent, let's put it that way. This is uh, okay to have what, what on the face of it might look inconsistent. Let's do another one. Here's a 58-year-old woman with metastatic lung cancer who's admitted to hospice. She has an enormous multi-generational family who have very different ideas about how she should be supported or not. Some family members are uh, very much wanting her to accept chemotherapy and aggressive treatments. Some family members are very comfortable with her approach to just let her go. Uh, and she is chosen, she wants CPR. She wants to be resuscitated, but then wants comfort measures only. What do you think? You guys okay with that? It's the flip-flop of our first guy. Is this valid or something wrong with this? She wants CPR, metastatic lung cancer. A substantial majority of our group feels that this is invalid. What would be the next intervention while she's uh, when she's coming into the hospice? Ideas from you all? Can they talk? Yeah, yes, sir. they can. Do you want to have any thoughts on what to do in this situation? That's okay. Well, you're pondering, I'll just tell you that, that the next intervention was an interdisciplinary family meeting to try to gather as many family members as possible and talk this through about what would actually happen with CPR. There's, you can, uh, there's probably several dozen videos now on YouTube where you can watch somebody getting CPR uh, and show that to patients and family members, not to scare them. I mean, we want to be compassionate here. But when people actually see it, often their views on wanting it are not changed for a loved one. Uh, and so that occurred and the patient, over a series of a couple of conversations, the family reached a better but not complete consensus on approach, but she became no code and comfort measures only. She died while in hospice after a lengthy stay of about a month. Was there a comment coming in that I didn't acknowledge? Did you, did you have some thoughts on this that you wanted to add? For me, in your mind, you said you're looking to get people to get into more education. Yeah, so we're, you're right on the money there. Let's do another one. Here's a 62-year-old woman with advanced liver failure from uh, hepatitis C, virus infection advanced. This was this is a 2014 case, so it was predated ACV therapy, effective antiretroviral therapy. Uh, alcoholism uh, comes into the ER, hypotensive and cephalopathic. A pulsed form arrives with her. She is DNR comfort measures only. It's signed only by her physician, which is not legible. It is not signed by the patient. Remember I showed you the form and down at the bottom the physician signs and the patient signs. So only signed by the doc. What do you think? Valid? Not valid? Not so sure. Let's take a look at what you think. Not valid. Whoa. Pretty good majority on this one that it's not valid. Yeah, technically it's not valid. What, we should, what should we do about this? What's your next step? DPOA. Yeah, DPOA. Well, no, no visible DPOA.
need any of it. <laughs> well, I'll tell you what happened. This person basically just got therapy for hepatic encephalopathy and hypotension. So IV fluids, lactulose, woke up in the ER after about six to eight hours. And uh, the ER resident showed the patient the pulse form and says, is this, do you want, is this, have you ever seen this before? And I said, oh yeah, that's what, I, yeah, that's right. That's what I want. <laughs> and they said, well, you need to sign it. <laughs> So they said, okay. So the idea here is it doesn't preclude treating somebody. You know, they don't need to be resuscitated right now. Uh, one might argue that IV fluids and lactulose aren't a comfort measure. But I thought that was probably artfully uh, done as a way to handle this particular conundrum and actually to get the post farm nailed down in the patient's directive. So it worked out fine. Okay, I'm told we're done with cases. So. Or if you'd have, you've had weird cases that you think the group could learn from. What we're, what we're not talking about is the fact that the pulse form almost always works pretty well. When we see a pulse form come in that looks to be in good, you know, in concert with what we think might be advisable from a provider's standpoint, we're good, right? But, and when we see a pulse form come in that we think might not be consistent or implementable given the current medical situation, it's a venue to start a conversation. I would say that's working. That's a, that's, that's a good outcome of a pulse form that seems inconsistent with the current medical circumstance. So most of the time, it actually is a very useful uh, document. 